Hengamana ingareo, ingatau wira pumanawa, ro, rakatera ma, tenakoto, tenakoto, tenatato katoa. My name is Harleen Hain, and I am extremely proud to be the Vice Chancellor here at the University of Otago. And on behalf of the university, I would like to warmly welcome you to this inaugural professorial lecture for Hallie Buckley. Now, at the beginning of the academic year this year, I had the incredible privilege of welcoming our scholarship recipients to the University of Otago, and there were literally hundreds of them. They represent some of the brightest, the most talented, and the most socially minded young people that this country has to offer. And for each one of these welcomes, the academic staff and I wore our academic regalia. And I explained to the students who were present at those ceremonies that although these costumes used to be worn by academics in the classroom, now we reserve them to very, for very special occasions. So if you ever see us dressed like this, um, something very important is about to happen. So tonight, we are wearing academic regalia again, and something very important is about to happen. Now, the other sign that something important is about to happen is that a number of important people in Hallie's life have gathered with our University of Otago community to celebrate her promotion. So on behalf of the university, I would like to extend a particularly warm welcome to those individuals. I'd like to welcome her mother, Leone, her husband, David, and her stepchildren, Courtney and Oliver. I would also like to welcome a whole host of people in Hallie's life who have traveled from all over the country in order to be with her here this evening. Hallie's uncle Richard has come from Wellington. Her brother Carl and his wife Judy and son Finnegan have come from Invercargill. Auntie Carol and uncle Greg have come from Omaru. Her sister and brother-in-law Pauline and Graham have come from Gore. Her auntie Julie has come from Toranga. Her friends Vivian and Fatu have come from Thames, and her best friends Clarity, Debbie, and Emma have come from Auckland. So what is so important about promotion to professor that warrants all this special clothing and all of these special people? Well, the rank of professor represents the pinnacle of academic achievement. And at the University of Otago, um, that achievement is earned on the back of years of sustained excellence in research, in teaching, and in service. Hallie, like all of our other professors here at the University of Otago, has excelled in all three of those areas. She is an excellent scientist, an extremely popular and effective teacher, and she has provided excellent service to her department and to her discipline. She is well known not only for the quality of her research, but also for her mentorship of emerging scientists, including both postgraduate students and junior academic staff members. So Hallie, on behalf of the University of Otago, I would like to warmly congratulate you on your well-deserved promotion to professor. I will now call on Professor Vernon Ward, the Dean of the School of Biomedical Sciences, to tell us just a little bit more about Hallie's path to professor. Norera Tenakoto Tenakoto Tenatato Kato. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Tenakoto Kato Hame Nui Tenakoto. Welcome everybody to Halle Buckley's inaugural professorial lecture. I guess uh, it's my task and privilege to introduce Harley to you this evening. And I guess it's quite striking as I look around here, I was expecting to see a broad range of people from across the university, and indeed, that is very much the case. And I think that that wide range of staff here is testament to the broad range of collaboration and work that Halley has done over an extended period. She's one of the leaders in the biological anthropology research area in the Department of Anatomy within the School of Biomedical Sciences here at Otago, but I really want to emphasize the strong collaborative base that she has across in, into the humanities, particularly into anthropology and archeology. span and I think it's a really strong example of what the quality of research that can be done and the things that can be discovered when we work across cross and multidisciplinary projects and programs and bring a broad range of techniques, knowledge and people together. I think it's a shining example of what can be done. 
So Hallie, for those of you who aren't aware, got her PhD in Otago in 2001, and then over the intervening 16 years has developed a very strong research program, outstanding teaching and outstanding service, as the Vice-Chancellor has already mentioned. But I think I want to just illustrate, I've mentioned about collaboration and some of the scope of what she uh, has done, and I want to just add a few examples to illustrate that. So she's in the Otago Global Health Institute, is one of the leaders of that. She is in the editorial board of Cambridge University Press, the president of the Australasian Society of Human Biology, a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries, member of the Paleopathology Society. She's got collaborations in Germany, Canada, throughout the Pacific, Papua New Guinea, here in New Zealand, Otago and elsewhere. And it's really, really quite amazing. She is one of the leading experts, not only in the Asia-Pacific region, as she claims herself, but actually in the world, in the area of paleopathology, and it, with her expertise in the Asia-Pacific region. High range of multinational and high-profile projects, some of which you'll see here through a whole raft of different countries, and I won't steal her thunder by running through them all. She has an outstanding publication record. At the last count, I have 60 journal publications, 20 uh, chapters, and three entire books is what she's produced to date. She's made fundamental discoveries in her field, and as you'll see from today's talk, that these discoveries are impacting not just on the history of, of people, but actually influencing our understanding of disease and disease processes, particularly in the Maori and Pacific communities today. What is perhaps less well known to many of you is that she's a consultant for, um, consultant for the New Zealand Police and at times for the New Zealand Army and has some, does a very large number of reports and work in those systems. And those are, for those of you that are scientists that like following various metrics, those are the sort of thing that don't tend to appear in metrics but are in them, of themselves extremely important. Now, I'm not going to preempt her, her talk by going through a lot of what's there. I think if you actually look at what she's done with a broad range of activities, the research she's done, the multidisciplinary components she's put together, you'll see those come through the talk today. And so with that, I would like to invite Professor Buckley to present her inaugural professorial lecture entitled Evolutionary Medicine, How Bioarchaeology Can Address Health and Disease Problems in the Modern World. No reira tēnē te mihi ki a koutou katoa. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Tēnā koe. Kia ora. Um, thank you all for being here. Firstly, I just want to start off by acknowledging the uh, tangata whenua of the land that we are standing on here for this um, wonderful Farewananga, University of Otago, and um, to thank Harleen for her very kind words, and thank you also, Vernon, and um, just to acknowledge all of my colleagues and uh, friends and family that are here today. This has been a very long journey, um, and yeah. <laughs> So I'll try and hold it together. Basically what I'm going to do is um, talk about my personal journey, a little bit of that, um, and uh, then get into the work, which is the easy stuff. Okay, but um, just before I start, uh, as Vernon said, I work with uh, human skeletal remains from various parts of the world, and um, so just so that you're aware, I do have some images of of Kauiwi Tangata, of um, some human skeletal remains, not from New Zealand, but from, from other parts of the world. So just so that you're aware of that before I begin. So, where did I begin? Um, born in 1969 to, um, to these very groovy people, John Buckley and Leonie Arnold, uh, my mother. Um, this family unit, uh, which consisted of myself, the little baby there in the arms, my sister Tanya and my brother Carl. Um, this, this unit didn't stay together very long. When I was three years of age, um, we were pretty much on our own, me and mum and Carl. And um, then we began a rather nomadic uh, journey. Through, through life and through New Zealand and um, everywhere in New Zealand, including Australia. Basically, from the age of three to 12 years of age, we moved at least once a year um, with um, my stepfather, Paul Mason, who a um, wonderful craftsman and artist, and my mother, Leonie Arnold, who um, is also an extremely talented 
artist in her own right. So basically, as I said, it was a nomadic lifestyle, um, and we somehow they managed to find places which were pretty much rent free, and um, <laughs> and so we we lived off their wits and their and their talent. Um, it was a hand to mouth existence, pretty much. There wasn't a lot of money around, but there was always a lot of ideas and a lot of inspiration, and I always remember Mum and Paul and all of our artist friends being very excited about things a lot. Um, so, so, so that was pretty cool. So anyway, till I was 12, and then it was just Mum and I on our own um, on Waiheke Island. Um, and, but pretty much while we were doing this nomadic journeying about the, about the country, uh, we went, kept going back to Waiheke, to Waiheke Island, and lived there probably five or six times um, during, from three till about 12. And um, this is not the Waiheke Island that you guys probably know today, as the resort that's full of BMWs and Range Rovers. This was, this was uh, a place where we could basically be wild and free, and we were very wild and very free. <laughs> and um, I was talking to my girlfriends today about how um, I'm not looking at you guys, <laughs> how basically what we would do is we would, we would, parents would open up the doors in the morning, we would be let out, we would spend our time <laughs> in the sea, and we would literally forage and hunt and gather for what it was that we needed um, to survive on. And uh, so um, there's my gorgeous brother Carl there, and um, my lifelong friends Debbie and Clarity and Emma, who are uh, were gorgeous and still are gorgeous. In fact, I've known Clarity since I was three um, and met her on Waiheke. Um, a little bit about school, not, but pretty lacklustre, really. Um, fifth, fifth form years, I, uh, fifth form, fourth form, had my maths teacher in tears. In fact, I just gave up and we used to go into the fifth form class with my fantasy novel because he had no time for me, so I would just read, do what I wanted to do with my time. The vice principal laughed when mum said I was going to university and um, the science teacher, Mr Hicks, used to just send Clarity out the door even before we sat down. He was like, you, out. <laughs> <clears throat> so anyway, I went through, um, managed to get through through school. While we were, while I was on Waiheke, my first love was um, horses um, and used to spend a lot of time jumping things. Um, on my horse, Kalani, until I discovered those other things there that, on motorbikes. Um, so yeah, so school, um, that was, was uh, not, not great times for me. But during my childhood, I was very fortunate to spend a month in Papua New Guinea, and this was uh, with my uncle Richard, Richard Buckley, who's also a great artist, photographer, uh, who took this photo in the middle here, and this is me as a little 10-year-old white girl up in the highlands of Papua New Guinea um, with the Asaro mud men. And so this, this was sort of the beginning of my anthropological journey, really, through the Pacific Islands. It was where I sort of um, developed a fascination for other people and um, other ways of life, and particularly the Pacific. So, yeah, so after school, I did one year at university and at uh, anthropology in, in Auckland, and then I ran away with an um, Australian chef to Australia, and so I worked in kitchens for a couple of years, washing dishes, doing cold larder stuff, loved food, but also discovered that I did not want to do that for the rest of my life, so I... Um, came back to New Zealand, worked for another year in vineyards on Waiheke to get back to university. So I studied anthropology at university and I had some fantastic teachers there. Uh, Roger Green, who's one of the gods of Lapita archaeology. Um, Lisa Mattisu smith was a fa fantastic lecturer. Uh, and Richard, Richard Walter also. Um, so it was there that I really developed my love and passion for Pacific prehistory and learned a lot and, and really um, wanted to um, go down that, that road. 1997, after some more, another gap year of doing contract archaeology uh, in Auckland for a bit, I, went, I wrote to Nancy Talis, uh, who was here at Otago, 
because I'd heard that she did bones, which is what I wanted to do, um, and went to Thailand, found my way there to Thailand uh, to work on a, an archaeological site there with her and Charles Heim. And so Nancy took me on as a postgraduate student, and um, and I worked, worked. I was going to do my PhD on Thai skeletal material, but the preservation of the site that when it came up to be my turn was really bad. This was an Iron Age site, um, so relatively recent in prehistory. Um, <clears throat> and then, um, so that was in 1997, but then ironically, 20 years later, literally, I'm now uh, working with Charles Heim back in Thailand on an Iron Age site of uh, spectacular preservation, and this is a, a project that I'm working on with um, Dr. Sean Halcrow and uh, Charles Heim, and also we've got a bunch of um, uh, new PhD students, and of course you can see Stacey Ward up there who's helped us a lot in the, in the field on that project so far. So, yes, I'm not actually going to talk about Thailand, I'm going to talk about the Pacific, but uh, just before I move on, I want to also, so I did my PhD and then worked, worked at sort of getting into an academic role, um, first as an assistant lecturer, but really at this point just want to acknowledge uh, Gareth Jones at this point, who had, um, who had the foresight to um, support to support biological anthropology and could see that this was something that students were interested in and supported biological anthropology uh, for Nancy and I to develop uh, this as, a, um, a, as something that we could teach and provide through, through anatomy. And so when I first came, it was, it was Nancy Taylor was the only faculty person, and now we have um, Lisa, um, Lisa Madison smith myself, Sean Halcrow, Michelle Knapp, and Johnny Gieber are all faculty members and numerous postgraduate students. So I think we're pretty, pretty strong um, as a field. Last but not least, of course, have to acknowledge this guy. Um. <clears throat> Went in to book my first uh, international conference and uh, air ticket and met this guy there. Um, <laughs> probably contravenes the uh, conflict of interest policy at the university now, but anyway, it led to, led, led to this. And we have had a wonderful life together, nearly 20 years. And he came with those two, Courtney and Oliver, as a complete package. And um, that's them now, two beautiful, wonderful, astonishing human beings. Right. Work. <laughs> okay, so what is um, evolutionary medicine and paleopathology? Um, this is what I do. Basically, evolutionary medicine is sort of looking at, um, at, at modern disease through the lens of evolutionary theory. So trying to sort of understand what, um, how we are today and, and what the evolutionary basis of that is. Now what I have uh, specialised in over the years is sort of part of this, which is paleopathology, which is basically the study of ancient suffering. So pathos, uh, suffering, and paleo ancient. And so looking at health and disease in the, in, in the past and trying to basically recreate the lives of people from, um, from different sources of evidence. So paleopathology informs, um, can inform on the past. So one of the sources of evidence is mummies, so this is probably one of the most famous mummies, is Utsi, who was found in the Tyrolean Mountains. Um, uh, he lived about 7,000 years ago, and uh, if you're ever in Bolzano in northern Italy, I highly recommend visiting this museum, it's fan fantabulous. Um, he, this is like an ancient cold case here. He was, through, through some modern imaging, it was found that he was actually uh, killed, shot in the back by, an, um, by somebody who we will never know, and was killed. And that's why he was, he was left for dead out in the mountains and then found. Um, also, we use the sources of evidence are skeletons, uh, and so this is bioarchaeology. Bioarchaeology is the study of human skeletal remains from archaeological sites, and this is essentially what, what I do most, mostly. So use the bones of these people to tell their story and, and put the flesh back onto the bones and tell the story of what their lives were. So, for example, this person here lived 3,000 years ago in Vanuatu. 
and he was buried with six other people here. So from our knowledge of anatomy and um, being able to actually identify these bones, we know that there were the skulls of three people, um, the bones of a, of a child, and that of a young infant as well. And you'll see this person a bit more later. Also ancient DNA is another way of looking at paleopathology, um, evidence of disease in the past, and this is something that is very strong here at Otago. Um, and um, also looking at ancient, um, the, the DNA of, of pathogens, which is something that we're working on here, and sometimes historical documents. Okay. A little bit of a mini teaching session here, just so that you can understand how we can, how we can actually do this, so the fundamental principles of what we do with um, evolutionary medicine and paleopathology. Um, bone responds um, in only two ways to, to a pathological process, and that's either by producing more bone or an osteoblastic response, or uh, by taking bone away, which is an osteoclastic response or a destructive response, and that could be to, to, um, to disease. It could be infectious disease or, or trauma or any other condition. Um, so, for example, this image here, we can see uh, this is a, a, an arm bone. These are arm bones from 17th century Solomon Islands. And this here is all new bone that's been produced by this osteoblastic response. And then there's also these holes which have been destroyed by the osteoclast, the cells of the bone. And this particular pattern of bone production and bone removal is what is specific to treponemal disease, or yours, and yours is a non-venereal cousin of um, syphilis, of venereal syphilis. What we do have with paleopathology is that we've got this, this one um, snapshot in time that we can see of when the person actually died, and also um, we don't see evidence in the bones of acute disease. So like a cold or a flu, there is no time for the bone to respond. And um, so it needs to be something that has actually lasted months or years for us to be able to see that. But what we can do is that we get the advantage of seeing the disease in its natural state before there has been any medical um, intervention. So we're looking at you know, people that are thousands of years um, long dead, so or hundreds of years. And what, we're, what I'm interested in is also looking at the origin of where these diseases have come from, how old they are in that particular environment, um, and that can then help, help us to understand what we see today. Uh, and also, a lot of the time, it's really literally just le reading the bones, looking at the bone surfaces to be able to see what's going on. It doesn't necessarily dis re require destructive analyses. So as Vernon um, noted, I've worked a lot in different parts of um, the Asia-Pacific region, so Vietnam, Thailand, Cambodia, but what I'm actually going to be doing is focusing today on the work that I've done in, in the Pacific. There's a little bit of edging into, into, into Ireland, Southeast Asia. So in order to, to um, do that, we need to first, to, to be able to understand the origins and antiquity of disease, in this region, we need to look at settlement history. So we have two main areas in the Pacific. One is near Oceania. So near Oceania here. So it ends at basically the end of the Solomon Islands and then remote Oceania here. Now the area of remote of near Oceania was settled about 50,000 years ago and Australia even earlier than that. And this was during the last ice age, so didn't require particularly sophisticated um, uh, vessels to get, a, get across. And then it's not until about three and a half thousand years ago that we actually see people settling the area past the Solomon Islands and into remote Oceania. And the, the people who actually did this were are known as Lapita, and we know um, they are visible archaeologically because they made these beautiful pots. And they, so we find evidence of these pots in, in, the, in their settlements, their old settlements. 
The origin of these people is thought to be from Ireland, Southeast Asia, and they were able to actually go out into remote Oceania because they had the, a new type of sailing technology and they were very skilled at doing that. The other thing about this is that they, um, these people were moving through this area and this was a new language group um, for this particular area, the Austronesian language. And the Austronesian language actually comes right through into Polynesia and um, New Zealand Māori is, is an Austronesian language. And so the Lapita moved through this area and colonised Western Polynesia, Fiji, Samoa and Tonga, and um, it's from this point that it is thought that they became biologically and culturally Polynesian people and then went further out to, to eventually settle New Zealand. Now, <clears throat> one of the key things when we're thinking about the, what the effect of the health and survival of these people was actually moving out into these new areas is that in near Oceania there is higher biodiversity, um, so there's more uh, wild plants and animals for people to eat, and there is, but there is also a higher disease burden as well, in particular malaria, as I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and these people were vulnerable, okay? Once you actually move out into a new virgin island environment, you're actually quite vulnerable to changes in the environment, to, um, to intergroup um, conflict and so forth, but particularly also to natural disasters. And we saw this even last week in Vanuatu, where a cyclone ripped through and, and caused damage, and we see it quite a lot in this region. So what actually happens when there's been a cyclone come through, if it's bad enough, is that it actually completely destroys what you may actually have in the wild environment to, to eat. So, um, you know, it strips all the leaves off the trees and everything. So these people were quite vulnerable as they were moving through this area. So basically what I do and what I'm going to try and do is to um, talk about the connections between diet and infectious disease and talk about this adaptation to the tropical and island environment in, this, in the Pacific and Southeast Asia. <clears throat> For my PhD work, um, I was looking at infectious disease history in the Pacific Islands, um, and particularly looking at the effect of malaria on the health of people in the past. And the, my fascination with malaria uh, actually began as an undergraduate when I was asked by one of my lecturers to write an essay on why um, the mosquito vector that carries malaria never actually made it past this line. What would be, what's the, the reason for that? Um, because we know there is a lot of malaria in this area, but there's no malaria in, um, or past this line here, which is called the Buxton's line and none in Western Polynesia. Um, so <clears throat> I went off on a bit of a detective trail and looked at the, the, at the ecology of these um, mosquitoes and their, you know, what sort of environment they like to live in and so forth and where we actually find them. And what, um, what I found was that you have, in the areas where you have the highest endemicity of malaria, so the highest disease burden, is actually where you have all of these mosquito vectors present. But then once you actually have less mosquito vectors present, there is lower malaria endemicity, and then we know that they never came out past this line at all. And the, the species Anopheles ferorti um, that we that we find in, in Vanuatu, but no, not past this, this line, this Buxton's line, doesn't like being anywhere near people. It doesn't like what people do to the environment because we chop down forests and everything to, to make gardens and so forth. This um, malaria species does not like being around that kind of activity. And also, they don't breed in artificial containers. So as the Lapita, we're actually moving through this area in their um, canoes, their double hull canoes. They were um, providing a, an environment that that particular species didn't want to be in. So this is, you know, this, this was what I came up with, and no one else has come up with a better idea. So <laughs> we'll see. 
Anyway, so then what I found in, for my PhD was I was looking at infectious disease and other diseases like um, anemia and so forth, and having a look at where basically found that there was a higher disease burden in the skeletons where there was malaria, uh, where there was malaria in this area, um, but not in the sample that I was looking at from Tonga. There, was, there were diseases, but it was a lower disease burden in that, in that area. And just to note here, this is another um, example here of yours, uh, which is assumed to have been present uh, right from the earliest human colonization in this area. And I'll touch on that point in a minute. Now, when I was doing my PhD, I was working on museum collections that had been um, excavated many years before and were from the last few hundred years of, um, of pre-European history in the Pacific Islands. And the Lapita were very elusive in terms of their skeletal remains. There were very few of them. There were 15 to 20 skeletons, many of which have since been disestablished by new dating programs. And um, there was no actual um, symmetry of Lapita except these um, Watam people from um, the Bismarck Archipelago in, in um, Papua New Guinea. And uh, so there was only eight people from, from that particular symmetry. And most of the research actually focused on looking at the origins, who these people were and who they were related to and so forth. There was only very anecdotal evidence of health, and very, few, um, very few data on, um, on diet and health and what these people were eating and how they were adapted to their environment. So basically what we needed was a really big um, skeletal sample of, uh, and really well preserved skeletal sample from a uh, Lapita site where no one could question the provenance of it, because the Watam one people fought about that for decades as to whether it was actually Lapita or not. Um, and then in 2004, uh, the site of Tiuma, which is a Lapita cemetery site, was found. It was actually found late in 2003 when bulldozers were actually destroying the site and luckily the local people that were working there recognised that this pottery was Lapita and that's because of the uh, training program that had actually been done by colleagues um, uh, Stuart Bedford and Matthew Spriggs so they could actually identify this, this pottery and called Stuart and said, hey, I think there's something a bit exciting here and so then they set up a field program to go there Stuart Bedford said to me, just on the off chance, he said, oh, I think, you know, they said that there were some skulls, so why don't you just come along and see what happens? And so by the time I arrived, they had actually um, started excavating the skeletal remains of um, people from, um, from this, this site, and it was clear that it was a cemetery of Lapita people. And nobody could question it because some of them were actually buried in Lapita pots. And in the case of this um, woman here, that there was actually another pot put on top of your head as well. So nobody could actually question that. And I'll talk more about that site in a minute. So one of the major themes of my research over the last 10 years has been trying to understand um, health and diet, basically because what we eat um, and, and how we eat the food and how we distribute the food can have quite significant impacts on our overall quality of life and, um, and health. <clears throat> now, we sort of think, as, uh, think of food. Some of us might just think of food as fuel. You know, you've just got to get it in and get moving. Um, some of us, uh, like me, really like to um, think more about food and, and, uh, and to eat good food and, and so forth. And, and food, uh, for many cultures, is identity. So it actually provides an identity to a, to a culture, like Italian cuisine or Indian cuisine or so forth. So it actually becomes an identity for, for, for um, identifying a, a group. So for example here, these are women from um, Udapiv Island in northern Malakula, and they're making laplap, which is a pudding which is made from... Um, starchy tubers like yam or, or sweet potato and it's grated and then um, put together in a pudding and uh, baked in an earth oven. And the women of Utapiv Island are very proud of their laplap. 
You know, this is what identifies them. <clears throat> food is also community. So food brings people together. As we know, if you ever have anything going on, people come together and they have to eat. And, you know, and, and what we like the most. And so here in these images, this is a, um, uh, a wedding from Utapiv Island, um, or the, actually the mainland on Malakula. And these are the yams that people have brought from their village. These are their prize yams. And those little tags that you can see, that's actually identifying who they came from. So this sort of sets up this cycle of reciprocity and obligation. So because it's all recorded and everybody knows who brought what and, and so forth. So it brings people together. Food is also about power. So food is also about prestige and, um, and uh, who, who gets what and how food is actually divided up depends on where you sit within that community. And so, for example, here, this is the, the food that is being divided up for, for the feast. Um, and so there's the pig and there's the yam. And I just want you to note that here, this is the head cut, which is the most prestigious cut of the pig. So whoever is getting that is considered to be uh, a person of high status. <clears throat> now, agriculture, the agricultural revolution, this sort of started about 10,000 years ago in different areas all around the world. Agriculture is defined as basically um, a domestication of plants and animals, of different plants and animals. And this domestication process involves um, modifications of those species so that they will actually become dependent on human management for, particularly with plants, human management for their, for their survival. And um, Basically, as more food was produced with this agricultural revolution, then it actually set up a cycle to allow um, a possibility for larger settlements, larger, um, larger population sizes, and then also eventually to um, larger um, uh, cities, towns, state-level society. And so uh, this also led to social stratification and social hierarchy. So meaning that, that some people were higher than other people. And as um, Jared Diamond here has said, while you would think this is all a good thing, actually what we see in bioarchaeology from looking at skeletal remains from the past is that in many centres around the world, there is actually a decrease in health with the adoption of agriculture. People actually get more unhealthy. What's quite interesting, though, is from the work of um, Nancy Taylor and Sean Halcrow, uh, Mark Oxenham, um, working in Southeast Asia, have actually shown that Southeast Asia, we don't see this pattern, that it's not actually until later on, and not until the late Iron Age, such as the site that we're all working on now, that you actually see this decrease in, in health. And... Um, so something's different about, the, about how people were managing food and producing food. Uh, the Pacific history of food production is actually quite different. <clears throat> Where you get a development of social inequality and social stratification, you also get um, a, the fact that some people will be more unhealthy than others. And unfortunately, what we see today and what we also see in the past is that if there is social inequality, it is usually the mothers and the children and their babies that actually suffer the most. Now, the oceanic food culture, as I said, is quite different to anywhere else in the world. It is um, essentially agricultural, so there is the management of domesticated plants and animals. Uh, when European explorers first came to Polynesia, they found that it was really intensive agricultural um, production that was, that was going on. Uh, any um, meal in Oceania, uh, a, 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 any meal that everybody sits down to, it's not a real meal unless there is uh, starchy root crops as part of that, so taro or yam or whatever. 
And so the sources of protein, such as the, the pork and the fish and so forth, are supplementary to that real kai, the real um, part of that, of that meal. And also pigs in particular, they are not consumed every day. That's left for uh, ritual occasions. This, um, this whole uh, food culture in Oceania um, is probably from Southeast Asia, came from Southeast Asia, where in Southeast Asia it's rice-based. No meal is a real meal unless there is rice involved in it. And uh, there is a hierarchy of food, of who gets what, and how food is, is distributed. And this can be based on age and sex, and we particularly see this amongst Austronesian speakers in the Pacific Islands. Now, the Lapita, what were the Lapita eating? Um, who, what, what, what was this base of, of, um, of their diet? So early on, it was thought that they were oceanic strand loopers, that they had um, sort of gone through this region uh, and were like wild, um, foraging on wild resources, particularly the, the aquatic marine resources, and that they were nomadic. And then later on, people started thinking, no, actually, what, um, what they must have been doing was actually carrying with them a transported landscape of um, domesticated plants and animals. So what that means is that they actually brought with them their plants and animals that were managed, and so they'd sort of move through to these areas and then become sedentary and set, set up their gardens, set up their, manage their pigs and so forth, um, and, and then move on from there. And this also includes the marine resources of um, fish and so forth. Okay. So, but what, so what is the direct evidence of this food base? Um, basically, I'm not quite sure what's happening with this. Okay. Uh, so when, when I started working on the Lapita people, uh, this was sort of the basic assumption of what, what was sort of going on in, in Lapita subsistence, and this was based on archaeological um, evidence and linguistic evidence, um, and, uh, but with the discovery of Tuuma, we actually were in a position to be able to start really getting at this, at this question. And so we uh, have done that with looking at chemical analyses of, of diet, so looking at um, stable isotopes of, of diet, so looking at the different proportions of, of marine, of um, fish, fishes from the deep sea and from the, from the reef, and also the terrestrial sources there. So basically you don't need to really worry too much about this graph, except that these um, here are higher in nitrogen, and, um, and these are, are lower in nitrogen and carbon there. So this is the most terrestrial on the graph, and this is the most um, marine on the graph there. Another way of looking at diet is to uh, look at what's actually trapped inside your dental plaque. So the work of um, Monica Tromp, Dr. Monica Tromp, who's now at the Max Planck Institute, has been to look at microfossils that are trapped inside the dental plaque, uh, including starch grains and so forth, of, um, and this is actually a skull from Tuuma there. And she's now working on looking at um, the proteins, uh, proteomics and fancy DNA stuff in the dental plaque as well. <clears throat> Another thing that we've also done is looked at uh, strontium isotopes as a way of looking at migration and interaction amongst these people during the Lapita Lapita period. And why would we be interested in this? Basically because it gives us um, information on the amount of movement of people. And we know today um, that migration and immigration of people, this can be extremely valuable. It brings new ideas, it brings new technologies, it brings new genes. But it is also a source of conflict as well. And is also can be a source of new diseases and so forth. So we've had several sites that we've been able to look at, look at this question. One is in, um, in Southeast Island, Southeast Asia, in Eastern Flores, where I worked with uh, Jean-Christophe Gallipo from France uh, here. Um, and this is Amy Foster and Rebecca Kiniston, and there's Sean, who actually 
contracted dengue while we were um, stuck in Bali and valiantly <laughs> worked. And then we actually had to walk out of the site because the boat was broken. Um, but anyway, way out in the middle of nowhere here in eastern Florence and highly uh, complicated, highly um, variable mortuary practices with the removal of heads here and um, dismembered um, body parts and here we've got a whole person buried in a pot with a, um, a conus shell bangle. Uh, what is key here about this site is that it's actually physically the bridge between Southeast Asia and Oceania, but it's also culturally a bridge as well, and we see that in the way people are treated in death in their mortuary practices. And then we have the site of Wattam. We went back to excavate the site of Wattam in 2008 and 2009 with Dimitri Anson and Peter Pecci, and we found a few more skeletons there. Uh, and again, this, this is towards the end of the Lapita sequence here. And the key thing here is that when these Lapita people moved in to this area, that there were already people living there before. And they already had their own form of um, plant management and, and food production there already. Uh, and there is evidence here in the uh, there's head removal there as well in the earlier ones that we didn't excavate. And there's also sex differences in how people were treated in, in burial. And then we have this the fabulous Uma, where there's nearly a hundred individuals that were excavated from this site over several um, excavation periods. And so this is a site that was directed by Stuart Bedford and Matthew Spriggs from Australian National University. It was a multinational um, and multi, um, yeah, multinational collaboration from France, New Caledonia, um, Australia, New Zealand, and so and and here, people here from Otago, including myself, contributed a lot of time and a lot of money to the site over the years. Um, but. Really very interesting in terms of the variation in um, how people were treated in death. So um, all of them had, all of the adults had their heads removed, um, but the female, they had their heads removed, but the males had their heads and the clavicles removed and the sternum as well, which is actually part of that highly prestigious cut that I mentioned before. Now, head removal, why am I going on about head removal? The head um, is the most sacred part of the body. In Māori tradition, the head is the most tapu, the most sacred part of the body. And this reverence of skulls and, um, and ancestor worship is something that we see throughout Oceania. <clears throat> so to summarise about 13 years of work um, in, in a couple of slides coming up, um, I just want to say here that this is the work of many students, many colleagues. Um, I've been very fortunate that I have come from an anthropological background. I had, um, I had these questions in my head about, well, you know, what were these people eating, what were they doing and stuff, and then had very, very smart students who could actually come along and help answer those questions from, from their research. So what is the overall picture here? Basically, what we're seeing in Pine, at Pine Harker is we're seeing a, um, a food uh, culture here where, from the stable isotopes, that they were eating mainly foods from the sea. So they weren't reliant on terrestrial sources. So they weren't reliant on gardens there at all. And we also see an amazing amount of um, migration into the site. These people were coming from all over the place, but for some reason were being buried at Pine Harker. At Wattam, this is up here in the up here in the on the map, um, we see some migration, some movement here, mostly in women, where the women are coming from different places, maybe as wives, being brought to the island as wives. And we see a lot of reliance on garden foods and a little bit of the marine foods. Whereas at Tuyuma, somewhat surprisingly, given this assumption that these Lapita people were moving into new areas, establishing their gardens and settling, and they were these agriculturalists with transported landscapes, 
we actually didn't find that in the stable isotope evidence at all. We found that they were mostly um, living from wild foods and, and um, marine-based foods. Some, um, some terrestrial foods, some garden foods, but the work of Monica Tromp that could actually directly identify the plants that, that they were um, growing, they were actually growing uh, foods that were sort of weedy, you know, like taro species that could actually just be planted out in the swamp and left to itself, the high-yield, easily managed type um, plants, and that are considered now to be like famine food. People don't really worry about those species now. And there was also migration as well. These people were brought and there were people moving into this area. This is a site that I didn't introduce, um, but this is all go, go spans from the Lapita period through to the proto-historic period. It's, it's from Lapita and it's up in northern Malakula. Um, the samples are a bit fractured here, so we can't get a very good pattern, but what we do see is that there is this move over time from, um, from a more t from a tumor like pattern to a more established garden type pattern later. So what we're seeing here is that this transported landscape idea is not important to the initial colonizers of, of Tiuma, that they were actually living more of a lifestyle like these people from Pine Harka. And in terms of health, we looked at the differences between the nitrogen values between um, males and females, and what the nitrogen values tell you is whether the, um, who was getting more protein and so forth. And protein is important because this is what gives you your iron sources. If you don't have enough iron, then you also can't absorb other nutrients like vitamin C and so forth. At Pine Harker, we see that there was a lot more protein being given to the males. And at Tuuma, the same sort of pattern, a lot more protein going to the males. Whereas at Watam, it was more variable. But remember, they're sort of in this different kind of environment. So in terms of... Um, the health, uh, the, where they actually are in terms of time and also the area through um, in between near and remote Oceania uh, determined on, on what sorts of foods they were eating and how that affected their health. And at Tuuma, we see high levels of nutritional deficiency, particularly scurvy, that particularly affected the babies and the mothers. So we're seeing evidence of maternal stress which affected the survival of these people. So these people were vulnerable in this area. Uh, and just going back to yours, in all of these early samples, there's no skeletal evidence of yours in these early samples. So the, again, another assumption when I started out doing my PhD, we haven't found the evidence of this. So they've actually, the, this disease has come uh, more recently, probably just pre-1500 AD. And I've got a PhD student who's going to come and help ho hopefully answer that question later this year. So basically, we're seeing here through this work on Lapita, we're seeing this evolution of a Pacific food culture from Lapita, or even potentially earlier, from um, this Austronesian expansion through Ireland, Southeast Asia, where we see this pattern at Pine Harker, um, which is actually fits within um, what we know about a culture of people who live today uh, in Ireland, Southeast Asia, who are the sea nomads or the Baju, who live off the sea and on the sea in these um, stilt houses, and they get all of their their, um, they get most of their food from the sea and what they need for carbohydrates and so forth, they trade with land-based people. So what I think, because I can say what I think right now, um, is that, that, that we weren't necessarily, that, that the Lapita, these early colonizing people, weren't necessarily these agriculturalists that moved through and settled and became sedentary, but it may have been more this um, sea nomad type um, people. Okay, so now we have today a big problem where we have um, uh, people are getting bigger, 
and people are getting more unhealthy. Um, this won't take too long. Yeah. <laughs> um, and people are getting more healthy through, um, through basically in all industrialised societies we see this as a growing problem, literally a growing problem where people are getting fatter um, and uh, problems with obesity, with hypertension, with diabetes and also with hyperuricemia and gout. Hyperuricemia means too much uric acid um, which can lead to gout. And all of this together is known as a metabolic syndrome. So like a perfect storm of these issues here. And what we actually see in, um, in the Pacific, and particularly Polynesia, is we see very high levels of hyperuricemia amongst Polynesians. And amongst New Zealand Māori, gout is actually the highest frequency in the world. So... Um, where did this come from, when, and when did it actually arrive here in New Zealand, and what is the history of that? So, skeletal evidence for metabolic syndrome, um, I have argued, comes from the skeletal evidence of gout, very specific um, skeletal lesions associated with gout, as seen here, and also a disease uh, called diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis, or DISH, which um, does this to your vertebra, and this is in the vertebral column here, uh, where you produce too, too much new bone. Now, amongst Europeans, gout and, um, and dish are associated with uh, high, foods high in fat and, um, and alcohol and so forth, um, so this interplay between genetic susceptibility and environmental factors. And in Europeans, it's more to do with environmental factors, with diet. Whereas in Polynesians, there is actually a genetic predisposition for hyperuricemia and all of the other things that go along with the metabolic syndrome. So gout and dish are archaeologically visible evidence of metabolic syndrome in, in the past. Now, here we are with initial colonisers in New Zealand, um, the Wairo Bar, the tūpuna from the Wairo Bar. So this is right up in the top of the South Island near Blenheim, a site that was excavated in the 1950s, 1960s. There were many burials taken from this site, and in 2009, <coughs> myself and Richard Walter and Lisa Madisoo Smith uh, we're involved in the re-evaluation of these, these skeletons, and Richard Walter uh, was, and Richard Walter and Chris Jackham were uh, responsible for actually the archaeological investigation for um, for the place to put them back. And so this site has, from the archaeological evidence, is actually seems to be a central place for burial, like what we were seeing in, in Pine Harker. This is where people were coming um, and, and having massive great feasts and there were people buried there in, in this area. There are two main groups of people from this site, the people of Group 1 who had very rich grave goods and um, complex burial ritual, including head removal, and then the, this is the people from Group 1, and then there were these other um, the rest of the people were buried uh, on a wider area and with less grave goods. And both dish and gout were found in the group one individuals. From the ancient DNA work that um, Michelle Knapp and Lisa Madisu smith her, her, their group have done, um, they're finding a lot of variability in the, in the, the genetics of these people, um, more than was originally thought. And this work is ongoing with uh, Catherine Collins is working on this with Lisa on a, a current Marsden project. But in terms of this metabolic syndrome story, uh, there was actually a, um, a mutation found associated with insulin resistance in this guy here who was from, um, from Group 1, Burial 2.1. I call him the Rangatira. <laughs> and his face was reconstructed by a colleague, um, Dr. Susan Hayes. Okay, now they were eating, group two to three, they were eating, oh, everyone from group one was eating a, a diet which was um, pretty much taken 
um, from the tropical East Polynesia. So they, were, they had a particular dietary identity, getting back to what I was saying before. Whereas everyone else at the site had different types of foods that they were eating and from different uh, ecological areas. So up here, this is like seals, sea mammals, and then the mower down here, and then this is the freshwater resources here. So what we're actually seeing is that these people, they, had, they were eating foods from all these different ecosystems, but they were all buried in this one place. And the group one people had come from somewhere else and were still carrying in their bones the, the signature of this tropical East Polynesian um, diet. And then with the strontium isotopes, we actually were able to even further cement that by showing that the Group 1 people had, um, were, a, were a particular group that were very different. Now, this metabolic syndrome um, evidence, we also see it at Tuma in Vanuatu. So the Lapita people moving through, we see evidence of gout and dish in their bones. And from the stable isotopes, we know that there was actually no difference in the diet between those that had the, um, that had the skeletal evidence of disease. There was, they weren't eating different things. So it must have been genetically regulated in some way. And so at the Wairo Bar, we have this, this, um, we have this ancient DNA evidence of insulin resistance and evidence of dish and gout uh, there as well. We don't see so much in mainland Southeast Asia, but I have another student who's actually going to go on that trail for me into mainland Southeast Asia looking at gout there. So basically what we see is this hyperuricemic trail of, of gout and metabolic syndrome from Taiwan, from Ireland, Southeast Asia, right through here to New Zealand, to the first colonising people of New Zealand at the Wairo Bar. <clears throat> Finally, just work that I've just started with um, Peter Petchy is in the um, just south of here in Milton on um, the early European colonists. So this is a site where we actually have been able to positively identify some of the people that are buried there. And uh, we have a, a big program, again, with Lisa Madisu smith on the, on the DNA and Michelle Knapp and work on the isotopes to characterise the health of these people and, and to, to tell their stories. Okay, and also I just want to acknowledge the, um, the, my colleagues, my iwi colleagues, who have allowed me to help them with the identification of their ancestors in, um, in the Kōiwi Tangata. For, um, for helping with the identification, telling their stories, and to also be involved in the reburial of these people as well. So here is the Wairo Bar, which is most famous, and here Pukaraki, just north of here, Karatani, and then an, a, a quieter ceremony here on Stewart Island, and then most recently in, in the Hawke's Bay. And just want to dedicate all of this to colleagues who are no longer here. And thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much, Hallie. That was a wonderful tour de force. Um, and and uh, kia ora tato. My name's Neil Gemma. I'm the head of anatomy, and it's my great privilege to do a, a sort of a, a wrap-up of what Hallie's just told us about over the last 50 minutes or so. Um, it's a tough act to follow, and I did have some notes, but I've just left them there. And I'm now going to wing it, because basically Hallie and Vernon and Harleen have pretty much said most of the things I want to say. So I just want to reconnect with the story that Hallie's told us here. Um, and, and just to, to try and uh, do some homage to that. So it started out with a really personal exposition of Hallie. So she, she took us down to her bones and explained where she's come from. And then with the bones of these Koiwi Tangata, 
she has told us of a story of their lives, how they lived, how they interacted with each other, the lives that they, um, that, that they endured in some cases, uh, and that has connected us with them. And she has continually, and she start, finishes with the, the, the Koiwi story, but I actually want to, I want to emphasise that that what I see in Halley, and indeed all her colleagues in bioanthropology, is, is that this is always this connection between what they do, the people that they've studied, and the communities that they work with. And, and, it's, and it's fabulous, and I am immensely proud, as a member of the Department of Anatomy and of the University of Otago, to have you all here as colleagues, and particularly you, homegrown, <laughs> as, as a full professor at this university. So congratulations for that, it's, um, it's, it's, it's truly astounding. And I know that you've been supported in that journey, and I acknowledge all that support from your colleagues and from your family. Um, we, I, I could go on, and I have, uh, but I won't. I, I, just, I just want to remind everyone of what this is about. Here's my prop. Uh, I'm subtle. This is a book that Hallie spent, I don't know, uh, 18 months working on. Uh, she said, oh, I'm off to study leave. What are you going to do? I'm going to write a book. <clears throat> okay, well, good on you. And that's it, okay? There's two others like this, there's 60 other papers. The volume of material that uh, has resulted in Halley being promoted to this, uh, to this position is significant. The teaching is significant, the service is significant. There's a lot of hard work here. And I, did, I do have a, a small story. So Nancy Tallis couldn't be here, but she did want me to say that, you know, as I knew, Hallie was uh, not afraid to share an opinion. I said, yes, thank you very much, Nancy, I know that. <laughs> but there are often opinions worth listening to, and I always appreciate those thoughts. She said she's a persister, and she told me a story, and we see that. I mean, this, this work we've, we've, we've witnessed is in remote locations. I mean, yes, okay, the sun's probably shining, and it's, you know, about 25 degrees, so it's nice. But, but it's hard yakka, okay, and it's... And it's dawn to dusk, and you go hard. And there are a hell of a lot of hours in what we've just seen. And some of the early stuff, Nancy says, well, you know, she arrived on this site in Thailand. She didn't actually really know where to go. It's in this remote location. Um, there'd been some confusion about instructions. It was before cell phones. Um, but she got there uh, through persistence. And there are a number of other stories about uh, trips to conferences where her colleagues abandoned her and left her in a hotel that they didn't want to stay in anymore. So she turns up and then she still found them. Um, but, uh, you know, stories like that. So, so good on you for persisting. I know there's a lot of hard work there and, um, and, and we greatly respect and appreciate it. We have a small gift. In fact, we have two. And this is where I need my beautiful assistance, but I clearly am doing it on my own. Um, but <laughs> if, if, if you would be so kind, we have, we have some small gifts for you to remember this uh, momentous occasion, and there's something else there that will be highly useful. So congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs>